Uh, so welcome everyone. I'm going to talk about um, the history of food adulteration and poisoning and it's going to include uh, adulteration and poisoning related to uh, water as well as food. So um, let me start off by wondering how we identify food adulteration in, in history. And uh, one of the most interesting projects that uh, I came across when I was last on sabbatical was to hear this lady, Professor Rosalie David, who is a, an anthropologist, uh, Egyptologist uh, at the University of Manchester. And she has developed a really very exciting program where she does anthropological examination of mummies and uh, Egyptian artifacts, in particular analysing bodily structure of mummies, and I'm going to be referring to her work uh, a wee bit later. Uh, but she and her team have uh, examined quite a number of mummies, uh, looking at their medical problems and other aspects of their uh, anatomy, and including uh, innovative techniques like endoscopy, uh, looking at uh, stomach contents before the cadavers are opened, but also x-raying them, and she's come up with really a lot of very interesting data. Uh, there are also, over the years, have been a number of uh, individuals who have been preserved uh, because of the forces of nature, and perhaps the most famous is Utsi, the Iceman, uh, so in 1991, uh, he was discovered uh, in the Austrian Alps, in the Alps between Austria and Italy, uh, frozen in the ice. And he was uh, a man from around 3,000 years BC, uh, but because he was frozen in the ice, uh, his body was really very, very well preserved, and he has been intensively investigated. And this is a reconstruction of uh, what he is considered to look like. He was about 40 years of age. Um, interestingly, uh, on x-ray, he uh, has a great deal of atherosclerosis, calcification uh, and degenerative change in his arteries. Uh, but on the other hand, he doesn't have any of the predisposing uh, factors that you would normally associate with atherosclerosis like obesity and uh, lack of exercise and smoking and alcohol. Uh, so it might suggest that uh, atherosclerosis in fact has got a genetic uh, basis or at least a much greater genetic basis than we otherwise thought. His complete genome has been worked out and so his uh, anthropological origins, his geographical origins have been worked out. Uh, his uh, relatives or his predecessors came from the Near East and northern Turkey. Uh, and interestingly, he also has been found to be infected with Lyme disease, which is a tick-borne disease uh, carrying the bacterium Borrelia, uh, which produces uh, fevers and flu-like illnesses. But there are a number of other uh, individuals have been similarly preserved. The Cashel Man in uh, Central Ireland from 2000 BC and then the Tullin Man from Silkeborg, uh, the so-called Bog Man. He was, preserved, he was uh, apparently ritually killed, he was hanged uh, and then his body was dumped in a, uh, a peat bog and uh, his body was then preserved uh, really very well. Well, we also uh, look at ancient sources, ancient literary sources, to get information. Uh, from Genesis, uh, you know, at the very beginning of the book of Genesis, it says that if we uh, uh, eat of the tree of knowledge, it's a bad thing to do, because uh, if you eat of thereof, you will surely die, which is not a, a good look for a university, I'm sure. Um, but uh, Leviticus, a bit later on, uh, tells all, uh, a large number of food restrictions, uh, and also des des describes diseases associated with uncleanliness. Uh, and then there are various ancient authors who also wrote about uh, plants and poisonous plants particularly. So Theophrastus, who was a student of, of Aristotle, wrote his history of plants. 
uh, where he described a number of uh, poisonous plants that were needed to be avoided. And perhaps the most interesting uh, person to his Diostorides, uh, who was a, um, um, a medical orderly, shall we say, or a doctor in Nero's army um, in the first century AD, uh, and he wrote a very extensive uh, materia medica describing poisonous plants and medicinal plants as well, apparently from the uh, plants that he collected uh, on his travels with Nero's army. And so we have a lot of material from these sources. And then going back to the Bible, I think we have the first uh, documented form of food poisoning, and that is what I'm going to call the book of of the tale of the quail. So that comes from the book of Numbers uh, in 11. And um, the story is this, that uh, after the people of Israel uh, left Egypt from bondage, they walked with Moses uh, uh, into the desert of Sinai. And then they started to complain about the fact that they didn't have any food and water, or at least the food was very monotonous. And so they complained loudly. And you'll forgive me if I start to uh, read the Bible here, it says. Uh, so they complained uh, to God. Uh, Moses uh, said to God, well, what are we going to do about this? And God said, okay, well, you shall eat not only for one day or two days or five days or ten days or twenty days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your mouth and becomes loathsome to you. So I'll fix you. I'll give you so much food that you, it makes you sick. And so um, then a wind went out from the Lord and it brought quails from the sea and let them fall beside the camp about a day's journey on this side and a day's journey on the side. And so the people worked all day and all night gathering the quails. Um, but while the meat was still between their teeth, before it was consumed, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people and the, and the Lord struck the people with a very great plague. Well, as in most Bible stories, there's probably a germ of truth in all that. And so it's a question of teasing it all out. Now, the quail is kind of interesting because the quail spends the winter, it, it, the, the northern, uh, uh, the quail is in uh, northern Europe in the summer and springtime, but it spends the European winter in Africa, uh, and particularly the North African coast. And at the end of winter, uh, when they fatten up, they make the journey uh, up the coast uh, along the Sinai Peninsula uh, and then go spread out into Europe. Uh, <clears throat> well, when they do that, they uh, feed on hemlock uh, and they concentrate an alkaloid, a poisonous alkaloid, uh, from the hemlock, uh, and the alkaloid is called conine. And that produces nausea, vomiting, and ultimately death. Uh, and Pliny, uh, the Roman writer in his Natural History, warns of the danger of use of eating quail. Uh, so that is the first uh, documented uh, form or story of, of poisoning. Uh, so the, the, the quail, in fact, are so fat after feeding up uh, for their journey uh, north that uh, they had made frequent stops. And so, you know, a great shower of these quail came and sort of landed on the camp, and that's what they ate, and uh, that's how they got poisoned. Then another interesting story from the Bible, uh, again associated with uh, poisoning, is the story of Moses and the brazen serpent, which comes up a wee bit later in the book of Numbers. And um, again, the... Um, the, 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 the uh, Israelites are complaining to Moses and the Lord that they're not getting any food, or at least the food is monotonous and they're bored, and why did you bring me out into the uh, wilderness like this? And so they again uh, complain to uh, Moses and thus to the Lord. Uh, and um, so, um, uh, let me just get the uh, idea here. Okay, anyway... Um, the Lord, because the Lord got fed up with all this complaining, it says, Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, speaking against the Lord, um, uh, take the serpents away. 
And so the Lord said to Moses, make, take a poisonous serpent, set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. Well, what's the story behind all that? <laughs> okay, well, um, so here is Moses, and he set the uh, a, a, a <coughs> serpent up on a pole, and the Israelites are being bitten and eaten by these uh, serpents. This is actually um, a uh, German uh, tala, uh, a coin from 1528, which just depicts the same story. Uh, <clears throat> well, what could all this be? Well, I'm just going back now to um, Rosalie David's mummy project. Uh, so in one of the mummies that she uh, dissected, um, the mummy number seven, 1770. I got all this from a lecture that I heard her give. It's really interesting. Well, she was very interesting at least. Uh, so she, first of all, x-rayed the mummy and found that there were these densities in the anterior abdominal wall. Uh, and then they were dissected out and found to be calcified remnants of the male worm of, of the guinea worm, so-called Dracunculus medinensis, which I'll describe a little bit later. And now the this worm, Dracunculus metadensis, um, once it uh, reproduces the female, uh, makes its way down into the person's legs, the victim's legs, where it forms ulcers, and then the, it breaks the skin, the worm, to try to get out of the body and deposit the eggs into water. Uh, so this particular mummy, in fact, just before death, had had one leg amputated, uh, and so the theory was that this person had been infected with Dracunculus metadensis uh, and in an attempt to get rid of the burning pain associated with the worm, the leg had been amputated. Well, um, so this is a, a flow chart of, of the, uh, the worm. Um, it lives in water, basically, or the larvae are in water, and then they are uh, drunk in infected water. Uh, the larvae then go into the gut, uh, reproduce the female, then makes its way down the leg uh, and breaks out of the skin of the leg in order to get into water again and shed its eggs to get the cycle. So they can also be uh, taken in by fish, which then contaminate the individual as well. But the point is that the worms uh, end up in the patient's leg. Now, in <coughs> this um, organism is called Dracunculus metanensis which uh, translates from the Latin as the dragon of Medina, which of course is in the Arabian Peninsula. It's also called the guinea worm, but it's well known in the Middle East as an infective agent producing burning pain in the legs. And the treatment uh, uh, is in the Middle East is to take the worm, pull it out, put it onto a matchstick, and wind the matchstick around and pull the worm out. Uh, ultimately, it takes quite a long time to do it, but that's kind of the standard treatment. So I'm going to hypothesize that the story of Moses and the brazen serpent is basically infestation with Dracunculus metadensis. Uh, and then you might also wonder whether the uh, Asclepius, uh, with his staff of the serpent wound around it, might also have its origin ultimately uh, in the midst of time in this story. Who knows? Well then, what about the plague of Athens? Now the plague of Athens, I see there are a number of uh, classicists in the audience, so I'm going to have to tread carefully here. Uh, <clears throat> but in the Peloponnesian War, the Athenians were fighting against the Spartans. And things were going badly for the Athenians, and they were blockaded. And so their food supplies were limited. Uh, and the historians uh, tell us, by Dora Siculus, for instance, that they were reduced to eating mouldy wheat because their food supplies were gone. Now, uh, they, they were then struck down with a terrible plague, uh, and as a result of that, they were weakened and they, they were defeated by the Spartans. Now, it's been suggested that this plague is various causes of infective organisms, typhus and typhoid and various other things like that. But it seems quite likely to me that in fact the mouldy wheat, which is known to produce a toxin, a very powerful toxin, which produces a quite recognized condition called alimentary toxicoleukia, uh, 
uh, which uh, breaks out sporadically in South Russia, in the Crimea, and in that area in Greece, uh, is produced by this uh, fungus called Fusarium sporotracheoides, and uh, it produces rash, fever, bleeding, vomiting, diarrhea, and marrow suppression with subsequent uh, infections and ultimately death. So uh, it's possible that uh, the plague of Athens uh, was also caused by food poisoning, ultimately from a fungus. Sticking with the classical story, uh, there is this uh, story that I'm going to tell you called the buzz for mad honey. Uh, now, <clears throat> honeybees in this particular part of uh, uh, northern Turkey, what is now northern Turkey, uh, Pontus, or Bithynia, as it was then, on the south coast of the Black Sea, uh, has a large number of rhododendrons. And the honey, uh, or the bees, uh, feed on the rhododendrons and take up a neurotoxin called gryanotoxin, and they concentrate it in the honey, of course. Uh, <coughs> well, there's a story from the Greek general uh, Xenophon in his Anabasis in 401. He uh, took a large group of mercenaries, apparently 10,000, uh, across the uh, peninsula of Pontus to uh, fight for a, a, a prince called Cyrus against uh, his brother. Uh, and on the way, Xenophon describes how the men got uh, into honey. They pillaged honey from the local hives and become, became delirious and disoriented and started to hallucinate. And then somewhat later, in 67, um, Pompey, Pompey the Great, a Roman general, was pursuing uh, this fellow Mithridates of Pontus across the Pontus Peninsula here. Um, and um, uh, things were not going well, uh, but the, uh, the uh, Persians... Uh, knew that uh, the honey here contained this neurotoxin and they left uh, uh, jars of this uh, affected honey out for Pompey's soldiers to eat and they gorged themselves on it and became incapacitated, hallucinating and uh, the story is all uh, well documented uh, and then Mithridates came back and apparently uh, killed a thousand of them uh, so this uh, neurotoxin is well known for producing vomiting and hallucination. Uh, and so uh, that is yet another instance of, of food poisoning. Uh, this is becoming very predominantly classical, but uh, a lot of interesting things happening in the classical world. So did lead kill the Romans? Well, who knows? But certainly the Romans ate a lot of lead, or they ingested a lot of lead. There's no two ways about that. And one reason, uh, or they, they did it in the form of lead acetate, and one reason was that they uh, boiled their wine uh, in lead-lined vessels, and they did that purposely because the lead made the wine sweet. In fact, they made it into a syrup called supper, which is still used in Italy, which is still found in Italy. Uh, and the uh, lead cups that they used, or the containers, uh, reacted with the acetic acid in the wine to produce lead acetate, uh, which is sweet. In fact, lead acetate is also called sugar acetate because it is sweet. Uh, and in fact, lead acetate has been used as an adulterant for wine uh, into the Middle Ages uh, because it makes it sweet. Well, the Romans certainly uh, took in a lot of this. The other thing the Romans did was introduce lead plumbing. Uh, and, of course, you know, they were great uh, plumbers. Um, and, of course, the uh, plumbum in Latin means lead. And that's the origin of, um, of the word plumbing. Uh, and so um, it's possible that they got uh, a fair amount of lead from their plumbing as well. So these are the, the features of, of, of lead poisoning colic and emaciation, anemia, wrist drop, encephalopathy, and ultimately renal failure. I'm going to come back to that. Um, I don't have much more information about that, but I think the Romans certainly did take in a lot of lead in their bodies, that's for sure, in their wine. And um, lead is also involved in a disease or a disorder that afflicted uh, Europe, and particularly Britain, 
in the uh, Middle Ages of the early modern period called Devonshire Colic. Uh, and that was well known in Devonshire where they eat a lot of, or they drink a lot of cider. And the cider is uh, produced in lead containers. And it was done that way in order to make it sweet. Uh, again, because the lead would react with the acetic acid in the cider to produce lead acetate. Um, and so it was stored, uh, manufactured and stored in these lead containers. And uh, there, um, this was really worked out. People uh, at, at a folk level had a fair idea that the lead was doing something bad to them. Uh, but it was all put together by um, this uh, George Baker, who was a physician of the uh, Royal College of Physicians. Uh, he was a, uh, a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians. And the college <coughs> put together a working party to investigate the causes, the ultimate causes of Devonshire colic that people really knew about. Uh, and he determined that, in fact, it was due to lead poisoning. Well, um, in relation to this, uh, the last thing that I've put up there is that one of the things that uh, lead poisoning does is produce renal failure. Uh, and there are two diseases that I've put up here that were extremely common in the 17th and 18th centuries, but are now quite uncommon in modern medicine. Now, gout does occur occasionally. It's not all that, that, that common. Uh, but I don't recall seeing a bladder stone, and I see a great many x-rays in, in the department. I don't recall seeing a bladder stone in the last 10 years. Extremely uncommon, extremely uncommon. But on the other hand, uh, literature in the 17th and 18th centuries is full of people with bladder stones. Uh, and of course there's a whole industry in removing them. And similarly, gout uh, appeared to be endemic. Now, quite a number of disorders like rheumatoid arthritis were probably misdiagnosed as gout. But nevertheless, you know, it, it seems to me that there was a lot more gout and a lot more renal calculi than now and maybe it was something to do with the renal failure or at least uh, failure to metabolize calcium or uric acid properly. Well, another disorder associated with food poisoning ultimately was uh, ergotism, St. Anthony's fire. Uh, and that was a disorder where the mold, uh, Plavicets purpurea, affected damp and moldy wheat rye and barley and the uh, clavicaps produces a toxin uh, that has a number of effects. There are three different forms of uh, ergotic poisoning. One produces la limb gangrene where the limbs are uh, become gangrenous and they have to be removed uh, and uh, this is a painting by Bruegel showing people presumably like that. Another form produces convulsions with diarrhea and vomiting but the most interesting uh, form produces hallucinations. Uh, and the uh, mouldy wheat occurred when there was a bad uh, season uh, and people were forced to eat mouldy uh, wheat. And of course, the poorer people in society were the ones that, that had to eat the, 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 the damp wheat, which then got mixed with the bread. Well, um, just referring to this hallucination uh, manifestation, I wonder, in fact, if the uh, bewitchings or the witch hunts in Salem in Massachusetts were not related to uh, ergotism. I don't think it's been suggested before, but I'm going to suggest it anyway. Uh, certainly, uh, wheat and rye was produced in the uh, Salem colony. Uh, it was reported as being very damp and wet, and they had several bad winters with uh, inadequate uh, food supply. So maybe they were eating the mouldy wheat. So what happened was that uh, two young girls in the community uh, became, began to have hallucinations. Uh, and then, of course, uh, it was thought that they were um, you know, affected by the devil and con having Congress with the devil and all this kind of thing. Uh, and so several people were, were executed and it was just a very dreadful thing. But maybe it was associated with ergotism as well, I'm wondering. Well, one of the uh, <clears throat> more uh, unusual scientific pursuits is the study of poo. Uh, and the uh, fancy name for poo, or at least uh, petrified poo, is a coprolite. Uh, now, this is Louis XIV, who uh, uh, built the uh, Palace of Versailles in around 1660. He died in 1720. 
Uh, but he had a country house uh, called Mali, the Chateau of Mali, uh, which was demolished uh, at the time of the revolution by the revolutionaries. Uh, but uh, what remained at Mali were, were the Lous. And the Lous uh, have been extensively investigated, or at least the Coprolites, in order to find out uh, what came out of Louis XIV's tail end. And also, uh, what came out of all his courtiers. Uh, and it's really interesting because it turns out that they were infected with a really a large number of intestinal parasites. Ascaris lumbricoides, the round worm, uh, Trichurus, which is a, a whip worm, Tinea solio, which is a tape worm, both uh, solium, which is the pig form, and saginata, and fasciola hepatica, which is a liver fluke. So they were all infected by these things. And they were probably caused by inadequate washing of vegetables, most probably, uh, probably lack no washing of vegetables, and certainly no washing of hands, uh, and inadequate food preparation, but they were certainly infected. Well, the history of, of um, <coughs> uh, infest uh, food poisoning uh, can really be uh, mapped before Frederick Ackham and after Frederick Ackham. He's kind of the, the, the pivotal person in this whole story. So I'm going to spend a wee bit of time on him because he's the most interesting character, Frederick Ackham. He was a German uh, and uh, he trained as a pharmacist um, and he um, um, transferred to London in 1789 when he was a, a young man of 20. He was, he was uh, sent to the German firm's London office to work uh, as, a, as a pharmacist or chemist, please. Anyway, he uh, developed his own business. Uh, he was obviously a very smart fellow, uh, and he developed a business uh, producing and selling uh, laboratory equipment. Uh, and uh, the study of his laboratory equipment and the way he sold it is interesting in the history of science by itself. Uh, but he also wrote a number of books uh, about chemical tests and chemistry in general. Uh, he also was um, instrumental in introducing gas lighting into London. Uh, and so um, here is a Rowlandson caricature uh, of London lighting. Uh, and so uh, here is the textbook that uh, Frederick Ackham wrote uh, about the apparatus uh, and machinery of uh, gas light, the way in which it can be produced, uh, carbonated hydrogen or coal gas, um, and you'll see that he calls himself an operative chemist, lecturer in practical chemistry on mineralogy and chemistry applied to science and manufacture of uh, chemicals. So he, in fact, was the first uh, person to make his living as a professional chemist in the sense of being a professional analytical chemist, uh, shall we say, as well as a pharmacist. So he also, uh, he wrote quite a number of books, and this is a really fascinating book to read, Chemical Amusements, uh, Curious and Instructive Experiments. So quite a lot of really fun experiments that he has there. So you might like to get onto the net and have a look at that. It's really quite a fun book. Um, but he also was interested in the manufacture of food and the way food was, was handled. And so this is his textbook on bread. And I'm heading towards uh, the, the bread story. Well, to buy a smock, I mean, the, the uh, problem with London bread was well known. It was just well known to be just frightful. And so here is Tobias Smott uh, writing in Humphrey Clinker. The bread I eat in London is a deleterious paste, mixed up with chalk, alum, bone ashes, insipid to the taste, and destructive to the constitution. The good people are not ignorant of this adulteration, but they prefer it to wholesome bread because it is whiter than the, me than the meal of corn. Thus they sacrifice their taste and their health to the most absurd gratification of the misjudged eye, and the miller and the baker. Uh, is obliged to poison them and their families in order to live by profession. So the idea was that pure white bread was uh, eaten by the, uh, the upper classes. And so people in the lower classes wanted to ape their betters. And they didn't want the brown stuff, the dirty and sort of a sign of a, a being a lowly character. They want white stuff because it was white and white, pure. 
And so uh, in order to make it white, the millers had to add alum. Well, this was uh, picked up by Frederick Ackham, and so he decided to get into the uh, uh, whole problem of culinary poisons, and so he wrote this ultimate book uh, called The Adulteration of Foods and Culinary Poisons, uh, a really very interesting text, and uh, this is where my frontispiece comes from. Uh, there's Death in the Pot uh, from King's Second Book of Kings. I won't uh, bore you by reading the, the biblical reference to that, but you might like to read it. It's all about um, uh, a fellow who uh, uh, entertains some prophets in the book of Kings, and uh, he puts on a stew, and uh, one of his mates brings some stuff, some vegetables or things to put in the stew and dumps them in, and the prophets eat the stuff and say, man of God, there is death in the pot, we can't eat this. Anyway, you can read the story. So that's Frederick Ackham. Well, in his book, uh, he uh, methodically went through a large number of uh, materials that were available in Britain, in London at the time, demonstrating the kinds of adulterations that uh, occurred. So vinegar was uh, uh, adulterated with sulfuric acid and lead, sweets with clay, lead, they were coloured with copper acetate or copper arsenate. Pepper, which was an expensive um, commodity, uh, was uh, expanded with gravel and leaves and twigs. Coffee with roast peas. Tea, well, tea coming from India was quite an expensive commodity. And so there was a thriving industry in using dead tea, uh, used tea leaves, uh, which were dried. Uh, in quite a, a labour-intensive way, and then remixed with the, the tea to <laughs> fill it out, and leaves of other plants. Water, of course, uh, was used to adulterate milk, wine, and sugar uh, with sand, dust, and lime, uh, all sorts of things. So Frederick Ackham, again, is a very interesting fellow to, uh, to read about. Um, he not only made this a very important book, uh, but he also was a very good chemist, and as I said, he was the first person to make his living as a, as a, uh, a chemist. Uh, and here he is giving lectures. Now, he started off uh, as an assistant to Humphrey Davy, uh, that you have heard about, in the Royal Institution. Then he branched out on his own, uh, giving lectures uh, in an institution called the Surrey Institution. Uh, so, in fact, if you look, this is a Rowlandson cartoon uh, from uh, around uh, 1790 or so, and you'll see at the top of the door, I've blown it up, so it's the Surrey Institution, and we know that this is Ackham here because the fellow down here in his pocket has got a book called Ackham's Lectures, so we know that that's what it is. So he gave these public demonstrations of chemical experiments of the way in which food was adulterated and the way in which you could identify adulteration of food. Well, the next important character in the uh, fight against adulteration is Arthur Hassel. Uh, now, Arthur Hassel was a physician in London. Uh, he was an apothecary, actually. He didn't go through the university system. He became a, a surgeon apothecary by being apprenticed to a, a surgeon, walked the wards, became a physician. Uh, some of you will uh, recognize the name and Hassel's corpuscles and the thymus. Uh, so his first... Um, uh, endeavour was to uh, use the microscope. He was a very enthusiastic microscopist. Uh, now the reason I put him up is that whereas Ackham used chemical methods to analyse um, adulteration, Arthur Hassel recognised that chemistry went only so far but could not really identify organic adulteration like used tea leaves or cocoa or gravel mixed in with tea and so on. And so that was the place of microscopy. Now, not only that, but the first half of the 19th century, from 1800 to 1850 or so, was the explosive time of chemistry. Chemistry was exploding and developing, uh, like Ackham. But the second half of the century, from 1850 on, was the period of the microscope. Uh, great advances in microscopy and microscopic anatomy. And so... Uh, Hassel's first book was called The Microscopic Anatomy of the Human Body. That's where he described these, Hassel, Hassel, these corpuscles and the thymus. Uh, but he then moved on to looking at 
the water in the Thames under the microscope and produced a book called A Microscopic Examination of the Water Supply to the Inhabitants of London and Suburbs, 1850. And so here is what the water from the Thames at Brentford looks like, all full of crawl, creepy crawlies and rubbish and goodness knows what. And at Hungerford it's even worse. Goodness knows what all these, these little creepy crawlies and organisms and things are. Well, the state of the Thames at the time was just dreadful. Uh, it was basically an open sewer because all effluent from London went into the Thames. The problem was that all drinking water, or the great majority of drinking water from London, also came from the Thames, which was basically a sewer. Uh, and this was well recognised as being uh, dreadful. Here's a punch cartoon showing Michael Faraday giving his uh, card to Father Thames, uh, who's dreadful here. Well, uh, and here's another, another punch cartoon, uh, which was derived from Hassel's work uh, showing a lady being horrified looking down a microscope at all the dreadful creepy crawlies that are coming out of the tent. Well, uh, things got so bad that uh, in order to get the politicians galvanised to do something, things had to be really bad. Well, in 1858, it was a very hot summer, and the stink from the Thames was so overpowering that they had to close Parliament, the House of Parliament being just about the that the, the politicians couldn't exist. And so that, of course, uh, focused their attention on actually doing something. And so uh, they commissioned uh, this fellow here called Sir Joseph Bazalgette to develop a proper sewage system for London which was, and there's a whole story that you could read about in that book, really interesting. Uh, so the Thames Embankment basically was a uh, grand project to um, uh, provide sewage for London uh, as well as an underground railway system, uh, or the basis of an underground railway system. So the two things were dovetailed together, and that's a, a big project by itself. Well, uh, one of the problems with all this uh, sewage uh, going into the Thames was the problem of cholera. Now, cholera was endemic in India, uh, and it came to Britain uh, through the north of England, through Newcastle, uh, it's thought at least, uh, in 1832, the first outbreak, but there were other severe outbreaks, 1847, 1854. Uh, and it was just a very frightening disease because a fit person could go from being completely well over 24 hours to being basically a cadaver. So what happened with cholera is that the colon really becomes like an open tap and all the body fluids are lost uh, through the rectum, uh, so-called rice water stool. So what comes out of the patient's tail end is like rice water. All the body fluids go and they die. So it was not known whether this was a, you know, a contagion uh, from organisms or just uh, an evil uh, wind and miasma. You see, the, the theory of, of uh, orga organisms really wasn't uh, worked out properly at this stage. And the problem was that uh, much of Britain's, of London and, and the people's drinking water came from the Thames, but it also came f from the Thames into hand pumps uh, which pumped water out of reservoirs and the reservoirs were placed right next to privies. Uh, and so people would go to the privy and de deposit their Vibrio cholerae into the privy, which then seeped into the groundwater into these holding tanks from which people got their water. Okay, well the problem was worked out by this man, a very famous story, Sir John Snow, Dr. John Snow, and the Broad Street Pump. So he was a physician and he worked in Soho, what is now Soho, in this block uh, between Oxford Street and Regent Street and Dean Street. That was his practice. And he noticed that uh, when there were outbreaks of cholera, particularly the one in 1854, they were all clustered around a particular pump. And so he epidemiologically uh, mapped out where the people became sick. Uh, and he worked out that there was a particular pump in Broad Street, in the centre here, that all the people that were infected had been getting the water from. So, being a pragmatic sort of fellow, he went along and took the handle off so no one could use it. Uh, that is the story. Uh, and then the epidemic of cholera 
in that area uh, died away. So uh, the um, pump, or replica of the pump, actually still exists in Broad Street. It was taken out by the London City Council, but uh, there was such a hullabaloo about it that the council put it back again, or put a replica in its place. Uh, so John Snow is quite an interesting character as well. Uh, he also uh, was an anaesthetist, uh, and he gave the first chloroform uh, anaesthetic to Queen Victoria for the last two of her children. Uh, she thought it was just wonderful. She raved about it. And so it was instrumental in, in uh, you know, making uh, chloroform acceptable to, to British women. Well, four years after that, uh, there was a, an outbreak uh, of uh, poisoning called the Bradford Sweet Poisoning. Uh, it was a dreadful thing uh, at the time. Uh, but it brought to people's attention the problem of adulteration of food. Uh, what happened was that um, sweets, uh, particularly peppermint humbugs that were people were particularly fond of, uh, used sugar. But sugar was very expensive, and so it was usually uh, cut uh, with gypsum, which was cheap. So the long and short of it was that a stallholder in the Bradford Market, which was a small market town at that time in the north of England, uh, got his sweets from a wholesaler, and the wholesaler had sent his boy, his apprentice, off to get a load of gypsum to put into a mix of the sweets. He, the boy went to the uh, chemist or the pharmacist who was supposed to provide the gypsum, and the, gyp the, the pharmacist said, yeah, it's over there, go and get it. And so the boy trundles along, and instead of picking up gypsum, picks up uh, arsenic trisulfide, tri trioxide, ars arsenic trioxide, which looks the same. This is it here, arsenic trioxide. And it's a tasteless powder, anyway. It got mixed in with the sweets, sold, uh, and 21 people died, and many more became ill. So uh, the story blew up, and it was all worked out where it all came from, but it reinforced the need for uh, monitoring and some act of parliament, like the Pharmacy Act of 1868, which controlled these measures. Well, uh, grocers and uh, people that sold uh, these things generally had a very bad reputation and uh, became worse as time goes on. These are two punch cartoons. So on the left, we've got a uh, very benign-looking grocer selling uh, fresh, uh, sweet-scented farm butter. But in fact, what goes into it is soap, fat, old animals, rubbish, arsenic, colouring compound, and it's uh, sweet creamery butter. And another one here, and the little girl here says, if you please, sir, so mother says, will you let her have a quarter of a pound of your best tea to kill the rats, and an ounce of chocolate so as we can get rid of the black people, so that's from Punch. <laughs> so they didn't have a very good reputation. Okay, well now back to Arthur Hassel. So he... Uh, decided again that he would investigate this and really sort it out. And so he uh, wrote this book called Adult Rages Detected uh, and using microscopy as well as um, uh, chemical analysis. But his trump card was that he formed an alliance with Thomas Wakeley, who was the founder and firebrand editor of The Lancet. Now, Wakeley was a real shaker and mover. In, when he saw some um, irregularity in the medical world, some humbug, some uh, problem, he was into it uh, with his scalpel, so to speak, his lancet, to lance the boil. And he was a complete thorn in the side of the establishment. In fact, the Lancet magazine uh, now is still... Uh, sort of that way, uh, it tends to focus on political issues and issues of uh, major importance to get things sorted out. You know, the two of them formed a very powerful alliance, which they called themselves the Analytical Sanitary Commission. And so what they did with their assistance was take a very large number of samples, in fact in one year 2,500 samples from various uh, uh, um, grocers around London and properly analysed the, the, the material, and Wakeley published it all in the Lancet, uh, to the great horror of uh, the m merchants, of course. So 
here are some of the things that he, he, he published. So here is a uh, uh, microscopic slide, again from 1854, not wonderful, but it's showing tea with various other um, uh, foreign material mixed in with the tea. Uh, and here he's got an analysis of some cocoa that was purchased from J. Hale, 53 Brewer Street, Golden Square, price nine pence a half pound, and it contains 100 parts uh, consisting of 20 parts sugar, the remaining parts combination of cocoa and starch, the proportion of 18 of the latter to 100 of the fourth of the starch being a mixture of tapioca starch and canary and so on. So he basically published all this, dread, this dreadful material showing exactly how um, grocers were, were adulterating all their food. Well, this led to ultimately uh, introduction of safety standards uh, and the Food and Safety Act. There were many of them, and the most recent one is the 1919 UK, where uh, local authorities were instructed that they had to appoint public analysts uh, to take random samples of food. And not only that, but uh, the uh, analysts also had to be members of the Royal Society of Chemistry. And the Royal Society of Chemistry, a very um, prestigious body, uh, also issued the statutory qualification for the uh, uh, public analysts, and there is an association of public analysts. Uh, so uh, it's all very well organised now. Well, just going, uh, I haven't really talked about America all that much, it's mostly Britain, but these sorts of things were happening in America as well. Um, so uh, the most famous story from America is perhaps the one of Typhoid Mary, a very sad story really. Mary Mellon uh, was an Irish uh, immigrant to New York City, uh, and she, uh, uh, when she arrived in New York, uh, she worked as a cook for various families. Uh, and it gradually emerged that the families that she worked for all came down with uh, typhoid. And typhoid is caused by salmonella poisoning, uh, salmonella typhi, which is uh, taken uh, from fecal material by the hands and incorporated into food uh, and uh, produces this disease. Well, she moved from various families cooking for them uh, and this pattern emerged that they were all developing typhoid. Uh, and so the public health authorities tracked her down and um, tried to get her to uh, subject to examination, but she would not. They tried to uh, get her to have a cholecystectomy removed of the gallbladder, which is uh, one of the sources of, of infection. She would not. And ultimately, unfortunately, she was put into quarantine, a very sad story, uh, from 1915. Uh, to 1938 when she died she was put into a quarantine on Long Island uh, in order to sequester her from infecting other people very sad story well in Germany uh, <clears throat> uh, particularly uh, in the early 1900s there was a great uh, vogue for radium and uh, radium uh, uh, use in food and, and other materials as well this is after Rutgen's discovery of the x-ray and, and also um, the discovery of radium, radioactive uh, radium. Uh, so it was put into a whole lot of, uh, of, of materials. Uh, here's whiskey, uh, chocolate. Uh, this is toothpaste, German toothpaste. And this is actually a bread wrapper, uh, showing that the bread is genuinely made by using radium water from a particular radioactive spring. Uh, but radium was used in um, all sorts of things, uh, face creams and uh, tonics of various sorts, as well as food. Well, uh, there's another story that you uh, may well uh, remember, the sad story of Minamata disease, or mercury poisoning, which uh, appeared in 1968. Uh, Minamata Bay is a bay on the southern coast of uh, Japan, and... Um, it turned out that a very large number of the families of the fisher folk, the fisher people who, who uh, fished in the Minamata Bay, had children who were very grossly deformed with mercury poisoning. Uh, and this uh, mother has her child uh, who was born in this way with this deformity. And so when it was analysed, it was found that all the mercury was coming from uh, two factories run by this Chiso Corporation, 
uh, which was leaching the uh, mercury into Minamata Bay, uh, where it was then taken up by the fish, and then there's a uh, phenomenon called biomagnification, where obviously the fish essentially concentrate the uh, mercury, uh, and then the uh, people eat it and uh, become uh, poisoned with it. Well, the uh, history of adulteration of food is really as old as history. Uh, here's a picture of a bread seller from um, a wall in Pompeii, the uh, city that was engulfed in 79 uh, by the uh, Vesuvius eruption. But many Roman writers, uh, including Pliny here and Cato, uh, talk about uh, watered down wine and bread adulterated with chalk and cattle feed. And Cato talks about adulteration of spices with, with old berries and stones. So it's really a very ancient practice. Uh, and here are sort of a range of modern scams. There are many, many of them. Uh, but of the ones on the right, just sticking with the Italian peninsula, uh, there are a lot of scams that come up every couple of years associated with olive oil. Olive oil is quite an expensive uh, commodity, and uh, the producers uh, pride themselves on extra virgin olive oil, which is particularly pure. Uh, but every couple of years it turns out that it's adulterated with cheap plant from Turkey and uh, other places in the Middle East. Um, olives uh, are fine when they're fresh, but uh, if you don't sell them all, you've got the problem what to do with last year's olives. Well, the solution is to paint them or dose them with copper, copper acetate or copper sulfate, which makes them green again. So that's what you do with your last year's olives. You dunk them in copper sulfate and uh, they perk up again really nicely, which is good. Well, other uh, ones that you probably are aware of are uh, jam, uh, of course. Uh, adding apple uh, to, to various kinds of jams is quite common. Uh, usually put onto the label with colorants, but um, specks of wood are also put in to uh, imitate raspberry seeds and strawberry seeds, which is not so good. Water, of course, has been used for diluting milk and, and, and alcohol for quite a long time. But a more recent innovation, which is quite innovative, I suppose, is injecting water into meat uh, and poultry to make it weigh more, <laughs> which is quite a neat wrinkle, um, because it's not easily detectable if you, you just make it heavier. And, of course, you make more profit. Of course, illicit drugs uh, are cut with all sorts of things, amphetamines and ecstasy and lactose and other pastes in cocaine, uh, fructose, corn syrup in, in, in honey. And another one that I've often wondered about is I eat a uh, sausage roll that I buy from a, like an airport uh, stall. It does look remarkably brown, uh, but apparently uh, there's a trick where you use um, brown bread uh, to beef up the, the sausage and you colour it with red ochre to make it brown so it looks like beef in your sausage roll. <coughs> well, a couple of standout scandals uh, that you will have read about in the uh, news, I'm sure. In 2013, there was the horse meat scandal all through Europe. So, some samples from Tesco, the big uh, supermarket chain in the UK, found that uh, almost all of their beef burgers contained horse DNA, uh, which is supposed to be beef. And so, there was more uh, testing and it was found that uh, most of them also had pig DNA. Uh, now, of course, pig uh, DNA is uh, not acceptable to Muslim people and to Jewish people, and so that was a problem. Uh, quite apart from the misrepresentation of the uh, beef as, as horse, there is the issue that uh, much, many of the horses were, in fact, race horses or athletic horses that had been uh, doped with phenylbutazone as part of their... Uh, you know, the racing career. And so the phenylbutazone was getting into the human food chain as well through the horse meat. So there was a great scandal with that. And here's a, uh, a local butcher in UK telling people not to stop horsing around and use their local butcher, which is a good idea. Well, more recently, uh, of course, Fonterra got caught up with a melamine uh, poisoning scandal in, in China. Now, melamine is uh, basically a cyanide or cyanamide which is used in making plastics. 
also a fire retardant. Uh, but the interesting thing about it is that chemically it's 67% uh, nitrogen by weight and so it is quite commonly used in China to increase the nitrogen content of materials that are supposed to be protein. So it, it, beef, it boosts the protein content when they're tested chemically for a whole variety of, of materials. Urea is also used to do the same thing. Uh, so it's in order to raise the protein content of the material. Anyway, um, the um, Fonterra baby food uh, got doctored in the same way with melanin in order to boost the protein content and that's where uh, it uh, came to attention because uh, the salt melanin uh, produces renal failure. It's a very powerful toxin and so many of these babies died uh, and that was the, uh, the whole problem that uh, was produced there. Well, I've been talking about uh, adulteration and poisoning uh, of people by food uh, and with water as well. There's also the question of food that is um, uh, questionable, shall we say. And so uh, I just want to spend a moment about looking at probiotics. Now, when I first heard about probiotics, I didn't really know what they were. Um, but there was a lot of stuff on the television about how good probiotics were and how I should be eating them. And apparently, uh, the probiotics uh, provide good bacteria uh, that uh, replace harmful bacteria in your gut and do all sorts of good things. Uh, well, now, this um, idea of using probiotics originated with a fellow called Ali Metsikoff. Now, Metsikoff is a, a, a well-known character in the history of science and medicine uh, because he was the discoverer of phagocytosis, which is the process whereby white blood cells uh, eat up bacteria and foreign material. It's called phagocytosis, and Elie Metchnikoff discovered that. Uh, he also uh, really was a pioneer in working out the issues around uh, cell-mediated immunity, and he got the Nobel Prize with Paul Ehrlich of Ehrlich Cimatoxylin fame uh, for, for that. Anyway, he got the idea of probiotics by looking at Bulgarian peasants who lived to a very great age. Many of them were 100 years old. And he figured that because they ate yogurt, uh, that this was the reason why they lived to such a great age. Uh, and so the whole industry really developed from that and so, uh, you know, claims are made on the television that it reduces GI discomfort and improves your immune health, constipation and avoids the common cold. The problem is that it's um, not supported by scientific evidence, or at least the scientific evidence is shaky. And although it's very widely, uh, they're very widely advertised in New Zealand, they're actually prohibited in the United States, or at least it's prohibited to advertise them in the United States. Um, uh, so New Zealand's a bit out of step there, I think. Uh, now the other thing you need to be aware of is that there's a distinction between a probiotic and a prebiotic. Kind of a subtle difference really, but a probiotic is uh, some kind of food that produces uh, uh, good organisms, good bacteria that replace um, bad bacteria. And of course you can use a uh, prepackaged form, uh, purchased at some expense, uh, but then there's another thing called a prebiotic, which is a food that promotes the healthy bacteria. Uh, and these are some of the foods here, bananas, onions, artichokes, garlic, and so on. They're not actually probiotics themselves, but they stimulate the growth of um, them. So that's all questionable. Um, well, um, I often when I looked at this uh, slide, um, I was struck by the word irony. And irony in English is a kind of a difficult word to uh, define, you know, and the Oxford English Dictionary has a bit of trouble defining it, but irony, I think this is an example of irony. So although I've been talking about food adulteration and fake foods, now on the internet you can actually buy a fake loaf of bread, and here it is. And so for a knockdown price of $22.95, you can buy a fake loaf of bread with sesame seeds. Um, it's soft to the touch. Uh, 
It was made in the USA. What, what more could you want? Um, please allow five to ten business days for delivery. And if it's an emergency, of course, uh, for rush delivery, you can call as an emergency number for your fake bread. So I think that is somewhat ironic. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Any comments? No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Socrates was poisoned with hemlock. He was, that's right. I should have uh, put that in too. I that's understand cool. that um, the accounts of the day implied that he just went to sleep. Yes. But I believe the alkaloid is very unpleasant. It wouldn't, yes. wouldn't have been a pleasant way to go at all. Yes. Well, you can tell me more about that. The, the accounts of Socrates' death, and the classicists might be able to help us here, was that he took it and uh, he was warned that he would feel numb from his feet and the numbness would come up. Am I right with that? That's right. It come up, and so he described, or someone described, it's in one of Plato's uh, symposia, I think, that the, the, the numbness spread up his body and then he passed away. It's in the crito. The crito, right. So that was it, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Hemlock. So it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yes? In the history of the Co-op movement, we were taught this at school, the end of the I think, as a movement against the doctor's opinion. Oh, really? I think in the 1850s. Right. Part of the former industrialization. Yeah. Now, you know, in the village level, you knew the baker and you knew where everything came from. If someone got poisoned in the village, you pretty much knew where to point the finger. But then as people moved into the cities, the supply chain became longer and uh, became harder to find out exactly where the operation go. The food went through several hands. Yeah. And, uh, so it was still the Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I know that Tui's and Bilburn's had trouble sometimes if they um, had too much nectar from broken ingrams. Do you know if that's the same issue that was... I don't know before? that. I don't know that. But the gryanotoxin uh, is produced by... Actually, um, it's produced by all kinds of ericas, I think. Now, broken ingrams, erica, and there's another erica that I've got on the name of. Yeah, right. And so... Um, the grand toxin is produced by them as well. So Bill goes on the same thing. Bill goes into it here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So again? Yeah. Okay, Pontocon. Yeah. Right, from Pontus, yeah. Yes. Yes. I understand that the honey from Pontus, you know, and the product of Red Sea, is still available and it's sold at quite a high price because of its vaguely hallucinogenic effects. Uh, you know, it's sort of like you get a bit of a high from, from eating it. Quite expensive. <laughs> okay. Thanks for your coming. Jerry, yeah. you need to come into the Still, I've got to stand and say that as a magnificent friend.